Okay, welcome one and all. I'm Daniel, Daniel Rowe from the International Office here in the University of Plymouth, and I work in the region of Southeast Asia, although I am based here in UK. So I've just come back from Southeast Asia, so I've got a little bit of jet lag and some quite big eye bags. So please bear with as I try and adjust to the time. It's okay, you'll have this yourselves when you get here in September. Um, we're going to do a, a, something a little bit different today. Um, rather than me just talking all the time, which if you attended the last session, you know I do that quite a lot. I'm going to change it up and actually have some other voices talking with you today. So this is very much different. It's a day in the student life. So you may well be attending this from Southeast Asia because that's my region and I invited you as applicants, but you might not be applicants and you might not be from Southeast Asia. You might be attending from somewhere else. Welcome one, welcome all. Or you may be watching the recording on our YouTube International Office page. Welcome aboard wherever you are from. Let's make this a, a, a chance today to really understand what it's like to live and study here in Britain's Ocean City in Plymouth and to find that out, not from me, but from students who actually do that, okay? So what are we gonna cover? Well, just a quick introduction. I'm the one on the left with the beard at the time. I'm not the one on the right on this picture. My colleague Jeannie is based in our Kuala Lumpur office. She's doing another event today, so might be able to join a bit later, but if not, no matter. You can see her email address if you wish to reach out to her in KL time, or you can reach out to me and UK time, but we're both here for you. And these contact details, if you don't already have them, will also be available at the end. That's just who we are. But actually, we are not the star of the shows today. We have some more important people to introduce you to. So today we're gonna to meet our panel. We're gonna have a panel Q&A where I ask questions to them, for you attendees to listen to. Then we'll have a chance at the end of the session for your questions. So anyone who's attending and watching this session today, live can put your questions in the q and a button please use the q and a button rather than either raising your hand or using the chat function because the q and a button means it all the questions will be there and i'll then ask those questions to our student panel towards the end of the session but you can start putting your questions in right now in the q and a button but the chat box i will leave empty in case there's any useful web links that i think we could perhaps drop in pertinent to what we're talking about. So the chat box will be a receptacle for these useful links should I need to put them in. So your questions go in the Q&A. Um, I'm gonna be at, at the end of the session, there'll be a survey that will be sent to you via email just so that we know how we did in case we can do it better in the future. Um, and by the way, warning, I might throw in a little speed round during this to keep the, my panel on their toes, especially on a Wednesday lunchtime, ouch. Good luck. Remember that Q&A is for any time. You can start asking the questions right away. And remember, this is questions about student life here in Plymouth. So if you have a question that's different, such as about your application or something like that, I'm sure that that's fine, but just email that to me and we'll look at it as an offline situation. Okay, so I just need to make sure that you can now meet the panel. So I have been very, very lucky in asking four fantastic University of Plymouth current international students from Southeast Asia to join me in this session and bless them. They all said yes. How lucky am I? So um, I'm going to ask them just to introduce themselves with a, a brief sentence of who they are, where they're from and what they're studying. And we're going to go in this order just so that people know. So Clarissa, you're up. Um, okay, hi, I'm Clarissa. I'm from Singapore. I'm doing my master's in um, neuro rehab. Milia, you're up. Okay, sorry. Thought I was lagging. Hello, everyone. I'm Milia, and I'm from Malaysia, and I'm a first year studying electrical and electronics engineering. Uh, so, hi, everyone. My name is Shafiq. Uh, I'm a direct entry. I'm studying marine science and navigation. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Fanya. I'm from Indonesia, and I'm currently a third year business management student. Thank you. Um, that's 
Short and sweet, perfect, exactly right. So now we have a little bit of an idea of who we have on our excellent panel. Let's see what they have to say in answer to these questions. And please note, if you're watching this live or indeed the recording, we have not prepared this in a rehearsal way. We didn't have a rehearsal like one day ago or one hour ago. So I have absolutely no idea what they're going to say in this session. I know, right? How exciting. So let's find out how they can tell us about their student life. And I, I hope it will be really useful for your attendees as well. So let's start with the Q&A. The first question I like to ask is quite straightforward, really. And that is, what did it feel like when you first arrived in UK and indeed in Plymouth? And how was that settling in process for you? So just think back to when you first arrived, please, dear panel. And let us know how that was. And we'll go in the order that you can see at the top left of the screen. Um, I think when I first came, I was a little bit like scared because I didn't know anyone. But um, we, we actually had a pre-meeting on online with uh, some of the postgrad students. So um, we got to know each other prior to coming. And then we kind of arranged to meet with, uh, in the first week when we were here. So it was quite, it was quite easy. Um, yeah, and I think in terms of settling, because it's quite different postgrad and, and the undergrad, so our cards and everything were all prepared for us um, and passed to us directly. So it, it was quite easy for me, yeah, in general. All right, so when I first arrived, the first thing I thought was, oh, I felt really, really cold, like really cold. <laughs> and so besides that, I came to the uni through the coach service that the uni provides and I met like a bunch of friends in that coach itself and I mainly stuck with them throughout my whole settling in process so I didn't feel completely alone. Um, when I first came here, uh, same with Clarissa and Milia, I suppose I didn't know anyone, um, especially during my research studies here. I don't have any people from Singapore doing the same thing as what I'm doing. So I didn't have any friends from Singapore who came here. So I decided to come here during the international week. And that's when I made new friends and the student ambassadors, they're able to help me in settling with all the administration. So it's pretty easy. Okay, so for me, I came here when it's COVID time. So the first thing that I need to do is to do a quarantine and my accommodation for, I think, 10 or 14 days, I believe. And that's how I spent my first two weeks here <laughs> in Plymouth. And um, and I think after that, I need to order my VRP card and my student card online because um, it was during COVID time, so I cannot uh, go directly into the office. And then settling up quite easy for me because it's not the first time I was here. So, yeah. Thank you, indeed. Thanks, all. Um, yeah, that, that arrivals experience is quite different if you've had to quarantine, of course. And we, we certainly hope that those, those days are beyond us. Um, it seems really quite a, a normal existence here now. And, and uh, everything's happening in person. And long may that continue but of course that was very tricky but I do understand of course when you first arrive you may well not know anybody and that's the same for any of our attendees at watching this session today and, and it was also the same for me when I studied abroad because yes about 2,000 years ago I also studied abroad and I arrived in another country alone and it is really really important to know that you have support that there's people there to help you settle in and there's ways for you to connect with other people whether it's on the bus on the way down or whether it's through your department linking you in with the other students on the program or other ways such as the welcome event the international weeks as well so it's really really helpful to hear those experiences thank you guys okay on to the next part tell us a little bit about your view of the campus um, by the way if attendees haven't seen the campus yet and would like to there's a qr code here that you can snap or there's a link at the bottom you can use and I'll put that in the chat later. And it zooms you into our virtual tour, which you can kind of see floating on the screen here now. So if you haven't looked at the virtual tour to see the campus and indeed the surroundings in Plymouth with the different views, please have a little look at that at some point. It will help you. But for the students who are actually here, um, what do you tell us about the campus? What do you say, Clarissa? Um, OK, to be honest, because I'm an allied health uh, student. I'm not on the main campus that much. Um, the, um, the allied health campus is actually at margins. 
which is nearer to the Derifet Hospital. So I can't really tell you much about the main campus here, um, but I mean, in yeah, because because I shut quite a bit to margins. Um, yeah, but but it's nice to get out of the city once in a while. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Milia. How about you? All right. So for me, I think the campus is pretty spacious. There's a lot of like nature as going around, so there's like a lot of trees and grass area. And since I do engineering, I mainly stick to the engineering building. And so in my free time, I'll just explore and there's a lot to explore on campus. Um, for me, I'm studying uh, marine. So we have, of course, the main campus where it's, uh, as per Amelia said, it's really nice. But I also go to the marine station, which is near the Barbican area. And you can actually, if you're going to study what I'll be studying, you can actually go on a boat and go out and you can see Plymouth from the other side, which is pretty nice. Okay, so for me, because I'm a business student, so I'm rarely on the main campus. Sometimes sometimes I do, but um, most likely we, ha we have our own building, uh, our business building. Um, but I can say that our campus is very modern looking compared to a few university in the UK, I think. Thanks, guys. And of course, it does depend what you're studying as to where you'll be studying it. So as attendees, if you're not sure where your program will be taking place, you can figure that out by looking at the web page or you can ask us and we'll tell you. You can send an email to me later. That's fine. Um, just understand that Plymouth is not massive. So if you're in the business building, you're about a five minute walk from the campus. I can do it in four because I walk very fast. Um, if you're um, going to the Marine Station, as Shafiq is doing for some of his programs, um, then that's about a 15 minute walk. This is a little bit further, but it's right down next to the ocean. So it's well worth the journey. And it's really nice when you're down there. And if you're going to the North uh, Campus up by the uh, um, hospital, as Clarissa said, then that's more like a bus ride. It's like a 20 minute by bus or I can do it by bicycle in the same time because I live right next to it. So um, it's it's a little bit further, but it's not a big city. And that means it's, it's relatively compact, but the majority of the students will be on campus. So um, that's why we do mention it. And that's why hopefully the virtual tour will show you that information. And by the way, all those locations mentioned by the panel are in the virtual tour. So you can go and have a look at those, those buildings and areas just mentioned virtually before you get here as well. Okay, can you describe a typical weekday for you? So a study day when the semester's going on, what would you say? And what do you do in your day-to-day -day studies? What does it look like? And, and where do you do them and when do you do them? So sometimes a lot of students who haven't arrived yet don't even know like, well, what time do classes start? What time do you have to get up? Um, just give us, pick a typical weekday and tell us a little bit about that, please. Um, okay, I think same um, for postgrad is really quite different and we have really, really few classes. Um, I think we each do about six to seven modules and we only have about five or six teaching days per module. So we don't have that many classes, um, but when we do, it's like a full day from nine to five. Um, and like I said, just now, it's usually at the Derifit um, or, or the Margins campus. Um, but other than that, we have to do a lot of things like um, self-study. So um, a typical day for me, I think I would really just get up and either go for a walk or go for a run like outside if the weather's good. Um, uh, and then I generally actually stay in my room to do quite a bit of my own um, dissertation writing and my assignment writing. Yeah, but more or less. Yeah, and um, our term schedule is quite different from undergrad as well. So I think everyone was on like um, the three weeks of spring break the past three weeks, but uh, master's st students don't have the spring break. So I actually had classes the past two weeks. Um, yeah, so it's quite different, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. All right, so my typical like weekday is most of my classes are usually in the morning and they're like pretty short. They're like three hours max. And then after that, I'll do some self-studying and then have lunch and all that. And then in the evening, I would probably most likely use that time to socialize. And so I socialize by hanging out with my flatmates or just joining some clubs and societies. 
and just participating in them just because I want to keep my studying and social life separate. Um, yeah, for me, it's similar to um, Larissa. I don't really have much uh, lessons ongoing. Uh, we only have a few modules, but most of the times I'm studying alone. Typical day for me will be like, yeah, getting up, um, going to the gym or going for a run and followed by just going to the library, sitting down there and studying. And if I do have classes, I'll go to the places where I have classes. And like Milia said, in the evenings, you just hang out with your friends or just sleep because I love sleeping. So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, for me, uh, in a week, usually I will have two till two until uh, two to four days uh, of lecture a week, and each day we will have like one to three classes, and one classes will last you for about two hours. Sometimes it can get short um, during the seminar, especially, um, but the lecture will usually last two hours, um, and then I will be having my own self study time either in my room or in the library and the rest of the time during the weekend I can spend it with my friends. Thank you and of course again it really much depends on which program you're studying but this is quite a common theme that sometimes students when they arrive to the UK first are a little bit surprised about about the number of, of hours they might spend in a classroom in a, in a more traditional classroom talking with a teacher or listening to a, a lecturer or a teacher. It is very, very different at UK University, especially if you're coming for a master degree or indeed if you're in the latter stages of your bachelor degree where you have more independent study. So don't be surprised by that, attendees, when you do arrive in the UK. It might feel different as to how it's taught and, and how you do your projects and where and when you do your projects. You might choose the library or you might choose at home or you might stay elsewhere on campus. That's, of course, up to you. But thank you for sharing that with me. And I'm really glad that we have undergrad students and we have a postgrad student as well with Carissa because it does, uh, of course, vary. And it's quite nice that we can share those differences with you. And, and certainly if you're not sure about your semester dates and when you have teaching and when you have holidays, of course, you can find that out from your program during the orientation session, because, of course, Clarissa can't be away on vacation when she has classes. So, of course, in a master degree situation, it might be different for you. But what's it actually like in class uh, when you are in a, in a more traditional class? So whether it's a, a lecture, a seminar, a, a tutorial or, or, or a workshop or, or indeed anything. Just exp explain how it is and how it feels. How do you interact with your teachers or lecturers and your fellow students? Give us a little flavor of the experience, please. Um, I think for me, my classes are quite uh, small. Um, we only have like a maybe maximum of 20 people in class. Um, it'll be made up of like um, the full-time international students. And um, we'll have quite a good mix of like the part-time uh, local physiotherapists who come for, um, I mean, I, I, whether they do just one module or they're like doing their master's over four or five years. Um, yeah, but generally there's, there's, a, there's a mixture of like lectures um, and then there's also time for us to do like uh, case study discussions or um, yeah, a bit more seminar style. Uh, and then we have some practical sessions as well. Thank you. So same as Clarissa, my class is pretty small as well, like 20 to 25. And in lectures, we'd have two different types of classes. One would be lectures and the other would be lab. So in lectures, it's mainly you just sit down and listen to what the lecturer is talking about. And then in labs, we usually like get up and do our own thing. This is when I interact most with my like peers. And you just kind of do your own thing. You can talk to the lecturers for additional help. But in our labs, you just walk around a lot. There's not really a lot of sitting down. So lectures is mainly you sitting down listening. And then labs is you doing everything. And yeah. Great. And yeah, for me, the typical class will be like, I think same with uh, Milia and Clarissa. Not many people in my class. Um, but interestingly, for, for my course, uh, we do work with the, the Saudi Navy and also with the UK Navy. So um, 
we sometimes get to go to their places uh, and also we go to marine station sometimes where like i said before we can go on uh, simulators or on the actual boat and just go out and it's a bit of a different environment than a typical classroom and interaction between them would be the same with the rest um yeah it's kind of fun for me in the uh, business course uh, we have quite a lot of people in the course itself um, sometimes we can get up to like 150 plus student in one lecture room in the lecture theater but during seminar we can maybe there are like 30 something people uh, and sometimes we can have like a guest lecture where there are like a business people that come coming to the class and um, maybe explaining about their business. Sometimes we also work with like a um, local business here in my course, yes. Fantastic, thank you. I think it's, again, very different, but sometimes students are a little bit surprised when they understand that they might be quite interactive in some of their programs. For some students who are joining us from, from um, education systems or classes where they they're, their job is more to listen, and students have told me that, but I like the interactivity and that's really part of the beauty of the UK systems. It does force you to be more involved in, in many of our programs and, and that's the interactive nature of the UK system. Okay, thank you for sharing this information. Let's forget about school for a minute. Let's forget about that. What do you like to do when you've got the weekend? or a holiday, such as a public holiday. And of course, yes, we're in the UK, so let's just add a little bit here. Let's say, A, if the weather's <laughs> nice, and B, if the weather's not quite so good. So how do you spend your time off? Um, so for me, if I'm in Plymouth, um, if it's a good, good, like, if it's a good day, I, I spend it quite a bit outside. So whether I go to like the hole and then I just sit there for a while or like I go for a run or like Royal William Yard or like just around the area. Um, if it's bad weather, then I think I spend a bit more time in the gym um, or, or I guess just in my room. Um, but if like uh, that's in Plymouth, I think if um, I guess the good thing about being here is that we get to travel out quite a bit as well. So um, I have quite a few friends in London, so I actually I do go up to London quite a bit, um, and then I just yeah stay with them and then explore London and the region. Gone a bit to like the Cornwall, Dartmoor side, um, yeah. And I guess during the holidays, then I really travel. So I just use this as a base, and then either we fly out from like Bristol or from London, and then you can go the rest of Europe. Thanks, Milia. So for me, on a typical weekend would be when I first arrived, I mainly just explored like Plymouth by foot, like without like Google map or anything. I literally just went out of my room and just started walking everywhere. And that way I kind of like memorized the whole layout of Plymouth. And this is if it's on a good weather. If it's not on a good weather, I'll probably do more like indoorsy things with my flatmates. Like I'm really close to my flatmates. So we would go mini golf. They've got like board game cafes. There's a lot to do here. And yeah, you'll never run out of things to do, even though it's a small place. Thanks. Um, for me, I'm a bit of a travel freak. So <laughs> I really love to travel. And uh, yeah, during the weekend, if it's good weather, I tend to go out, uh, be it Pibabika, be it the hall, or be it Cornwall, that mall. And if it's not a good weather, uh, probably just stay in with a couple of friends. You just invite them or you just go to a nearby pub or a club and just gather with your friends. And for holiday, um, it's really nice to be in, in the UK because flights around Europe is really cheap. So go for it. And also I really recommend uh, to go around the UK itself. I've done actually a road trip from here all the way up north to the Scotland and down on the other side. So pretty much covering the entire bit. And it's, trust me, it's really beautiful up in the Highlands area. Okay, so for me, how I usually spend my weekend is, um, if it's a good day, 
uh, we will kind of like have a walk in the hole or maybe you can go to Cornwall because it's pretty nearby and there are many things to explore in Cornwall. Um, sometimes we do have like gathering with other Indonesian students or Indonesian people that are living here. And uh, if, it's not, if, it, if it's not a good weather, then maybe we'll just stay in, um, booking the cinema room, watching movie together or cooking together. Um, and maybe for, if I don't know if there's any Indonesian watching this, but um, other people mentioned that they can travel to uh, other part of Europe. But for Indonesian, we, we need to apply for a visa for it. So it's kind of difficult if we don't have like a long holiday that, and it's kind of not possible to do it because it's just kind of a waste of time to go to London, make a visa and then just go for like a week. So yeah, um, I would suggest to explore UK more then. Thank you. Um, by the way, dear panel, you've just embarrassed me because you've basically all done stuff in your free time that I just don't do. So um, admittedly, I occasionally go to Cornwall, which is a little bit to the west of Plymouth, if you don't know, dear attendees. It's the, the very last west bit of the country. And I do go there sometimes, but only because my parents live there. So I feel I should go and see them. Um, I've certainly never just flown off here and there around Europe. Clarissa and Shafiq, that's amazing. And as for driving all the way up to Scotland and back, you've put me to shame. I'm embarrassed. I'm British, and yet I know so little about my country compared to you guys. So well done for really maximizing your time. And I think that's what a lot of international students do. They say, hey, I'm in the UK, I'm in Plymouth only for a short time. I'm going to max it. I'm going to do as much as I can with it, whatever that is. But I love the idea that, that it's there if you want to do it. But also you can stay in the city, as Milia said, there's actually quite a lot of stuff you can do here. And yes, there's good weather, bad weather. The other thing I'd say about the weather is don't worry about the weather too much. This is not to the panel. They know they're here. I'm saying to the attendees, don't worry about the weather too much. I have a good friend from Sweden, my flatmate from London. He was from Sweden and he said to me, there's no such thing as bad weather, only the wrong clothing. Um, so obviously you can pick up a nice University of Plymouth uh, hooded sweatshirt here, like a bit of branding when you get to the shop on campus and it comes with a hood and it's quite warm. Um, that's quite a good idea. That's my marketing job for the university shop there. Um, but just don't worry about it. it. It's usually quite windy in the UK. You'll, you'll deal with it um, and just you get used to it. You get used to the fact that there's only one hairstyle in Plymouth and that is sideways. So you'll, you'll be fine with that. Okay, thank you for sharing your experiences on your days off and making me look bad. Um, let's see what the next question is. Yes, yeah, so it's connected to UK weather. I've mentioned about the sideways hair, but how do you feel about that? Do you find you have to wear lots of clothes or different layers or it doesn't bother you? How do you prepare for it? Um, I think I quite like the cold. My friends keep saying that I wear very little for the UK weather, but um, I guess, yeah, the key is just a layer. So I just usually just like wear a uh, knitted and then depending on how cold it is, how thick my jacket would be. But um, yeah, the UK weather, I mean, it's it's quite nice and cool. Um, but at the same time, it's like, uh, like Daniel said, it gets really, really windy. And um, like umbrellas are quite useless if it rains because okay. I've like broken like two umbrellas. Yeah, so... I don't even bother with umbrellas anymore. <laughs> so yeah, I guess that's yeah, that's more or less the UK weather. All right. So one of my culture shock when I came to the UK was how no one used umbrellas. Like my first week here, <laughs> like I had an umbrella and I felt so not cool. Like everyone was not using an umbrella and they were just walking around with their hood on. And like I'm from Malaysia, so it rains like a lot and it's always raining. And so like umbrella is like a common thing. If it rains, I have an umbrella. But I came here and no one was using an umbrella. So I kind of just stitched my umbrella and always wear something like with a hood on. Or I always bring a raincoat in my bag because it rains a lot and it's very cold. And I personally like the cold because back in Malaysia, I love like layering and it's too hot to be layering. So right like here, I'm in my zone and I can wear whatever I want and feel comfortable. So yeah. Thanks. Yeah, as for me, um, just advice. Even if the weather report tells you that it's sunny, bring your raincoat. Uh, UK's weather is really unexpected. One moment it's going to rain, next moment it's going to shine, next moment it's going to snow. 
you don't know what's going on there. But uh, like uh, both of them have said, it's it's really rainy most of the time. Um, but because most of the students actually do come in like September, October of, for masters in uh, January. So those are the times that it's, I mean, it's going to be spring and summer soon. So it will be really nice weather soon. But for now, it's just rainy and cold. So just bring your raincoat wherever, wherever, wherever you go. And yeah, you'll be good to go. <laughs> Yeah, so that's true. Umbrella didn't work really well here. So a proper waterproof coat or a raincoat is a must. And um, maybe if you really like wearing umbre umbrella, maybe Plymouth is not uh, one of the city that you can use it here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Poor umbrella salespeople in Plymouth are clearly not doing a very uh, good trade because I think three out of four, if not all four of you are like, nope, not using an umbrella. Um, just to give a little bit of balance, as if this were the BBC, we like to be balanced. I will say I do own an umbrella. It is right here in my bag. And it, I've had it now for two years. And the, the rest of you guys are going, what, really? You can't use it then. No, I do use it. It's one of those ones that claim to be storm proof that they can withstand anything so so far i have taken it out in all weather i'm convinced i'm convinced i'm gonna prove it wrong and it's gonna collapse on me but so far touch wood it has not broken however a couple of times i felt like i was gonna take off like mary poppins so you've got to be a little bit careful maybe a good idea a hat or a hood is the sensible approach but i think as we're all saying on the panel here Weather is weather, just deal with it, it's fine. And actually, it's quite nice to have different seasons. I've got many friends who come from uh, Singapore and um, from Malaysia, and they say, well, it, it's really nice and hot there, but they don't have the variation in the seasons. And in the UK, you certainly do. And as Shafiq mentioned, that those variations may come in one day or even one hour. So it certainly keeps you on your toes. Thank you, okay. Um, so. Let's think a little bit about logistics, because that's rather important. Students might not know about this. So, dear panel, can you tell us how do you usually get around in Plymouth and what do you do to get stuff? Like, how do you get your food? What do you do? Um, so for me, I stay in the city centre. Um, so I don't go anywhere except on foot, um, except when I go to school at uh, margins, then we have to take a bus. But um, like with our student card, it's free. So, yeah, so... That's the only time I take the bus. Other than that, I usually just walk around. Um, in terms of food, um, I think being here, like I'm like five minutes away from like all the all the grocery stores. So I think there's like one, two, three, four. There's at least like four, four of the big um, supermarkets around here. So yeah, that's not much to worry about food. Oh, and then the Asia Mart is like just behind my building. So yeah, everything is within the same area. All right, so I usually just walk around everywhere in Plymouth. I rarely take the bus just because all of my classes are in the middle. And like, I'll occasionally take the bus to like go to some places. Like there's a bouldering center that I really like to go to and I'd have to take the bus for that. But other than that, I just walk everywhere like 30 minutes walk that's like I still do that and as for food food shopping I only like get groceries I don't eat out because I like to spend my money on other things so I uh, like I have a favorite supermarket I'd go to Aldi and Sainsbury those two are my main and they have like almost everything I need and occasionally I'll go to like the Asian market to get some like rice noodles or anything like that yeah yeah, same like, uh, similar to both of them. I just walk mostly in Plymouth. Um, yeah, like for food shopping, just go to the supermarkets. I don't really live near the city center. Um, I live near, just off the train station nearby there. So for me to go to the city center, it's still near. It's like 15 minutes walk. So um, anyways, the thing to know about Plymouth or it's a big culture shock for me, was the opening times. It's not like where I'm from or in, in Asia, typically, where it's open till late. It's not, especially during Sundays or during holidays where they actually close way earlier. 
So just one thing to know about that. But other than that, you're good to go. Yeah. So as everyone said before, it's it's all walking distance here. So you don't need to take a bus or a taxi or anything else. Um, you can get to your destination pretty quick by your feet. I mean, and for my food shopping, usually I would just go to Sainsbury in Iceland because they're next to door and also have Tesco Express next to door. So it's pretty easy. Um, and as uh, Shafiq said before, uh, they close really early. But I think Tesco and some other supermarket, they close uh, like 11 p.m. at night. So you still can have any emergency stuff during night too. Thank you, guys. Well, really excellent answers to explain a couple important things. Yes, it is a bit different in the UK. You, you don't find the shops are open quite so late and the malls certainly don't open so late. So that is a bit of a surprise for most of our students when they come to the UK. And it might catch you out in the first week where you think, oh, I'm just going to go down to the, oh, no, I can't, it's closed. Um, but as Vanya just helpfully added there at the end, there are other shops that will be open late. In fact, there's a couple of um, bigger uh, supermarkets, if you did have an emergency, that are open 24 hours. Um, the other thing I was quite interested to ask you, and I, I was going to see how you were answering that, um, I haven't been in a supermarket for about five years because I just order all my stuff online and then I book a time slot and then the supermarket van arrives in that one hour and just delivers all the stuff to me. Um, I don't know if that makes me lazy or, or what, but I, it's interesting. Perhaps it's better to go in on foot because you can have a better experience and you get out and about. Um, but just also know that, that food delivery is quite a possible thing as well. Okay, so let's see what else we have to ask. Oh, yes, let's deal with a couple of the emotional sides of things because, you know, studying in another country for minimum a year, sometimes quite a bit longer for you guys, um, it's, it's a big deal and you may never have traveled overseas before. So how do you feel um, sometimes? Do you get homesick or not? If so, how often? And if you do, what do you do about it? Just tell us a little bit about how it feels to be living and studying in another country for a while. Um, I think for me, because I'm only here for a year, so it's, it's not so bad. I did my undergrad in Scotland, so it was, that was a bit longer. Um, but uh, I guess it helps, number one, that there are friends here and we're all on the same course um, and we're equally like free or we don't have classes at the same time. Um, and then it also helps that I have friends in, in London. So if I'm really homesick, I like go and look for them. Um, yeah, but I think now it's much easier. We have Zoom, we have FaceTime, we have like a lot of things that we can do if we really want to like keep in contact with people back home. So yeah, I, I think I cope with it quite, quite well, like when I'm here, yeah. Or like Clarissa mentioned, like because we have FaceTime and Zoom and all this, I don't part particularly get homesick as often as I think I would, maybe like once every three months. And I think a reason for that is the International Society and the Malaysian Society, I'm very active in both of those societies. And that helps me like feel like I'm around people like I'm familiar with and I don't feel completely alone. And every now and then I would go around like the UK because I've got friends around the UK who also are in the same position as I am. So I don't feel homesick as much. And I don't think, like you would think that you'd feel homesick, but you really don't. So yeah. Yeah, similarly to what uh, both of them have mentioned. Uh, and also for me, I'm, I'm actually here for less than a year, so. I don't really feel that much of a homesick, but I do at times, uh, for example, uh, events like Eid recently. Uh, so what happens is I'm in the International Society as well, and uh, we are going to celebrate it soon as a society for those people who have not been able to go home or visit their families. And these are the occasions that actually, you know, when you are together with your friends, you don't really feel like you're missing home that much. So, and also if, if you really, feel like you miss your friends or families back home, just call them, especially your friends, but just be aware of the time zone. For me, I don't care. I just call them and it's like, hey, are you sleeping? It's like, what? It's like, <laughs> but yeah, don't worry about it. 
time will pass by really, really fast. Okay, so um, I've been here for about like three years now, and actually I never get a homesick before. Uh, we usually spend time with a lot of uh, Indonesian friends here that are that are currently studying in the university. But uh, maybe it's not about the homesick, but it's about the food sake. Because we are in Southeast Asia, we have quite a lot of good food, and maybe you can miss that a bit because you know UK food is. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but if we do get um, if we miss uh the food, we can just cook it. Uh, we bought a lot of like um a lot of spices and stuff that we can cook here we usually cook together with other indonesian people or if we have like a spare time we can go to like um other indonesian people who are staying here so like so we can go to their home and we can feel like more at home and yeah thank you um yeah there's the different ways of dealing with it recognizing it is part of the piece and actually i don't know if you guys did this but at the start of each academic year we offer international students who are arriving into the UK and into Plymouth, we offer them a little bit of a session to think about how you might feel as the year goes on and, and what happens when you might feel a bit homesick. I don't know if you attended one of those sessions, but they are available for arriving students and recognizing that you're feeling a little bit strange or a little bit away from home or possibly homesick is part of the piece because once you recognize it, then you think, okay, now what do I want to do about it? But it sounds like your, your mechanisms for coping are all excellent and, and it sounds like you're doing really well. And I love the idea of just calling up family no matter what time of day or night it is. I mean, it happens to me because I was uh, I travel quite a bit out to Southeast Asia and I people from Plymouth call me because they don't know I'm away. So I've got to keep remembering to turn my phone off. Anyway, um, thank you for sharing this one. Um, that's, it's been alluded to already. Some of you guys have mentioned some of the things you do, but maybe not everyone. Maybe just a little bit more detail on, on how you make friends or how you share social time with people so that you don't feel like you're just in a box in a room by yourself in another part of the world. So how do you socialize or, or how do you explore Plymouth and the region? Um. So for me, I think maybe because I'm, I'm doing my postgrad and I'm a bit older, but I think my my parting days are quite over. So I, I'm quite a chill and at home person. But um, in terms of socializing, I think I I have like good friends at like the gym or that I've met at the gym or like my classmates. And then we generally just hang out in those settings or like go out for coffee. Um, how to explore? Oh, occasionally we've gone for like Hikes. like you can take like um so like uh, Shafiq was saying you know there's like boats at the Barbican so I think a couple of times we've taken like the very short like ferries just to the opposite and then we can do like hikes and everything there um yeah it's quite nice just for like a uh, three hours two three hours to just go for like a nice hike there I think it's things that we can't really do back in Singapore like the best we have is like some reservoir or like McRitchie or something but yeah so compared to that I think there's a lot more like outdoor stuff to do here um yeah um how do I socialize like there's three main like my main source of socializing would be socializing with my classmates socializing with my flatmates and socializing like with the people I meet through clubs and societies and I think joining a bunch of clubs and societies like helps you a lot more in case you don't get along well with your flatmates or you don't get along well with your classmates. And just having like a bunch of different groups and not having all of them together, personally for me, because I'm more introverted, that feels, that puts me more at ease than having like a big group where everyone knows everyone. So having those separate things really helped me. And I can like switch it up whenever I feel like, nervous about something and so because i have like people i can hang out with i would explore plymouth with them because exploring it alone you can never be too safe so just like you know more company more safe and so i would explore plymouth with them there's a lot there's a lot of things to do with them and you meet friends through friends so don't ever feel like oh, I'm going to be alone, I can't make friends, because you can always just meet people casually, randomly, yeah. 
Yeah, um, similarly, like for me, I also join um, societies, uh, as I said before, I'm from the International Society, and we do host a lot of events, um, all just meetups for the week, just go and talk to people, not only in the society, but also my own individual friends that I have, uh, and of course, exploring Plymouth, like what Faris have mentioned, there are a lot of beautiful places nearby Plymouth. To be honest, Plymouth is one of the best places to actually study because you're surrounded by beautiful nature compared to central England, <laughs> or unless you're studying in Scotland, that's a whole other thing. But uh, yeah, I mean, I have traveled, like like I said before, I've traveled all the way to, to Scotland uh, from Plymouth with three other strangers that I've met here. And we spent three weeks and getting to know each other and it was kind of fun and they will definitely be my friends for a lifetime so there you go yeah i think everyone has mentioned everything how to socialize and how to explore Plymouth. um maybe what i can add is you can try to find a contact of someone from your country so it will make you more comfortable when you arrive here for the first time um getting into contact with um maybe anyone you can get a contact usually from from daniel or some or Ginny. <laughs> um and then um to explore Plymouth, usually we explore it together with our friends and it's it's really we have like very beautiful scenery so it's really great here thank you i'm aware that we're doing really well with your answers you're giving lots of really helpful answers um so we're doing really well i'm also conscious of time and i want to get to the students questions i'm gonna try and move a little bit quicker i think it's probably the last question before the dreaded speed round so um this question is just if there's one piece of advice that you could give to a student who may be nervous about coming to the UK or indeed about coming to Plymouth. If there was anything you could offer them to help them either feel less nervous or, or give them a little bit of empowerment, what advice might you give or, or what advice might you wish you had heard? Um, I think this might, this might seem a bit like obvious, but um, I would say we, we, you really have to step out of your comfort zone. Like I think, like uh, in, in schools, like you wait for people to come and talk to you or you wait for like um, people like to be asked to introduce yourself. But I think if you see someone that like, like for me, there, there aren't that many Asians in my course. So once I saw like these two Hong Kong girls, I was like, hey, what are you guys like doing? Where are you studying? Where are you from? And now we end up hanging out a lot together. So I think it's, um, yeah, I think it's really just stepping out of your comfort zone and like getting Thing to know people and taking the first step to know them yeah hmm. mine would be to live in the moment as cliche as it sounds but like most of the time i was here i'm always like stressing about like Ooh, lost your okay. Seconds. okay all right um so future exams i would always stress about them so i think just living in the moment and not being nervous about what's about to come because everything is just going to fall into place. So there's no point of stressing out so much. So yeah. Yeah, as for me, like what both of them have said, step off your comfort zone. Trust me, it will be your best decision that you have made, at least when you're coming uh, to a whole new other country, not knowing anyone. Naturally, you'll speak to people that you do not know. Naturally, you'll you'll join clubs and societies so don't worry about it you'll be a best decision and you won't feel lonely i think uh, that's one of my advice everyone maybe will kind of felt afraid or they might be like alone and lonely but in fact you will meet a lot of new people from around the globe you can you can make new friends new connection it, it was it will be really fun and it is one of um once in a lifetime moment for us for for all of you maybe who are coming to uk later on and uh, i think we just wish you the best luck thank you and thanks for those really lovely words and i'm, I'm sorry clarissa but I, I don't think what you said was was too obvious i think it does need to be said and i think all of you in fact have just given really empowering idea of just go and do things don't be scared get involved take action be proactive but also be reassured that there are people there to help you because of course it is the unknown if you've not been here before it can be a little bit scary or daunting 
but no really really good bits of advice thank you for that and, and living in the moment and, and not 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 worrying about it just just going for it is really really helpful so thank you for that oh dear we have reached the speed round i'm terribly sorry uh dear panel but i'm going to throw some things at you now so this is no word of explanation you just need to give an answer we don't need to know why just an answer if it's an either or you have to choose one sorry it's wednesday that's the rules we'll keep the same order just for speed um so you it's going to be either a one word answer or just a very brief answer with no explanation and it has to be fast good luck okay here we go favorite place on campus for study i don't <laughs> my room library um the seo rooftop favorite place on campus for not study um the fish and chips cafe <laughs> my room seo rooftop <laughs> <laughs> A study room. Okay. Favorite cafe on campus or off campus? You can be favorite cafe or restaurant anywhere. Um, the uh, Prime Prime Cafe. Starbucks. To be honest, I don't. But if I were to name a uh, cafe club, uh, Portland Square Cafe. Favorite shop? Primark. <laughs> Let's go. Aldi. I will say Primark too. Wow, two for Primark. Wow, good advert for Primark here today. Best day of the week. Friday. Wednesday. Friday. Oh, Wednesday. Wow, a dead heat Wednesday and Friday. Who knew? Now then, finish work way ahead of deadlines or study all night before deadline day? <laughs> ahead, definitely. <laughs> ahead of deadlines. Yeah, ahead for me. Um, I study all night before deadline. Yeah, that was me too, Vanya. I'm glad it wasn't just me. <laughs> My brain just worked better. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Right, fish and chips or pasties? I think I know how Clarissa's going to answer this one. Yeah, fish and chips. <laughs> fish and chips. Fish and chips. And fish and chips too for me. Oh, come on, guys. Pasties are lovely. They're just like handheld <laughs> pies. They're beautiful. But okay, fish and chips are good too. All right, um, next up we have scones or ice cream? Uh, scones. Ice cream. Ice cream. Ice cream too. <laughs> Typical scones for me. All right. Favorite food fried in the UK for the first time. Okay, I, I'm gonna skip. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Beans. Mine would be beans. Uh, chips. <laughs> Uh, cream tea for me. Cream tea is the scone you just saw in the previous picture. Okay, this yeah, is th th that's the first thing out. that I've tried here. Uh huh. This will catch you out. Weirdest food tried in the UK. Um, in Scotland they have black pudding, <laughs> like oh haggis, haggis. I have no answer. I'm gonna skip. <laughs> uh, the black pudding too for me. Wow, guys, that's just, you know, I, I should have made the rules more clear. Skipping means uh, forfeit. You're going to have to go and do 20 push-ups now. <laughs> okay, um, can you tell me one club or society that you have joined or tried? I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't join any in... <laughs> in that's okay, in, in you don't have to. <laughs> uh, I joined the dance society. Mine is uh, international society. Um, K-pop society. Very cool. Favorite season? Um, I'm gonna say spring. <laughs> spring without a doubt. I'm waiting for summer. Oh, I love the winter. Nice mix. No one chose autumn. That's fine. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Water. 
tea. Coffee. Okay, thankfully someone said tea. We are in the UK after all. A favourite place in or near Plymouth? Dartmoor. The Hall. Cornwall. Um, Hall Park. Beach or Dartmoor? Dartmoor. Oh, yeah, both beach. actually. <laughs> no beach. Yeah, Dartmoor. Mm, bitch. You've survived. <laughs> you survived the hell that is speed round. I'm sorry that I threw a lot of questions at you that you might not have been ready for. Um, okay, I'm, I'm hoping that you do find some food that you like in the UK because I'm a little bit worried that you don't. But don't worry if you're attending this, this event and you're thinking, well, what do the students eat? I think that's a really important question. So guys, what do you eat? Um, well, I, I usually cook, like I, I don't really eat out, um, but to be honest, eating out here is, is a little bit more affordable than I imagined. Like, um, I think when we eat out here, um, even cafes or restaurants, you can get them for like either a single digit in pounds or like low tens. Um, as compared to places like London and stuff, it's really a lot more expensive there. So, um, I would say I, we cook quite a bit, but, um, yeah, if you want to eat out, it's not too expensive. Yeah. Okay. I like cooking instead of eating out just because I get to pick what I want, how I want it, the spice level and all of that. So I would say I eat in a lot. Um, I'm a terrible cook. I started out as being a terrible cook. Now I'm still terrible, but... <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I do cook a lot. Don't ask me what I'm cooking. I, I, I myself do not know. I'm, I'm just eating what I'm trying to cook. So as long as it's okay, that's fine. <laughs> I would still recommend cooking because it's still cheaper than eating out. Um, but if I don't have time, I would, I would usually just buy like a frozen food, frozen stuff. So you can just air fry it or you can just open it and it will be done in a minute. Cool, thank you, and thanks for sharing that. Okay, well, um, I, I kind of want to know what Shafiq is cooking, but if he if you don't actually know yourself, then I guess I'll never find out. Um, but that's very, very honest. Thank you for sharing. I never could cook when I was a student in my first year, but like my mum reminded me, if you can read, you can cook. So actually I started to read the recipes and follow them, and it, it wasn't pretty for the first six months, but stay with it, Shafiq. I'm sure you'll get there. Okay, thanks for sharing, guys. And let's see what our attendees have to ask i don't know what questions are up there because i've been too busy talking with you um a student is asking about their application status of course i will be dealing with the um application related queries separately to this because i can't ask our student panel to talk about that um and students were asking um about airport transfer so um did i think milia you took the airport transfer with the university mm -hmm. bus didn't you yeah. um do you, can you explain what happened or how, how you did that or did anyone else do that as well right so basically like when i got like off i had to we they made like a separate whatsapp group where they had different like the students picking up and they said like oh we're waiting at terminal xyz and i just literally headed over there the airport is like pretty straightforward and if you ever get lost you can always like ask the staff for help and then I met with a bunch of like other students and the student ambassadors there. And they kind of brought me like us all to Plymouth and the students ambassador helped me settle into my accommodation since I'm in uni accommodation. Yeah. Thanks. Did anyone else do that or did you find your own way? I find my own way during the COVID time. Wow. You are a pioneer, Vanya. You really are genuinely. Yeah, I found my own way too. Uh, I took the bus from London to Plymouth. Yeah, I often do that myself. When I landed at Heathrow last week, I, I look at the timing of my arrival and I, I decide whether I'm gonna wait to catch the bus because it's more direct, um, but it takes a bit longer. So then I think about, well, depending on the timings, I might go on the train, which means you take one train into London Paddington and then another train from Paddington direct to Plymouth. So you don't have to actually go around London in order to change stations, it's quite easy. Um, Obviously, on our website, people, if you don't know, our web pages will have 
um, advice on how to get to Plymouth if you don't know. But if in doubt, book the uh, arrivals bus. Um, it costs £20, pounds, um, so it's not a lot. It's like the cheapest way you can get to Plymouth. Um, and it tells you which days to arrive. Um, and I'm aware that I've not put in the chat yet, but I can put a whole bunch of links in the chat, which I'll do right about now. And um, these have lots of useful links, including um, about the arrivals experience. So that'll go into the chat and then anyone can copy and paste that across. OK, um, great. So thanks for that question. Let me go back to where we are. So um, for those who have stayed in school, university accommodation in our halls would you recommend the pre-packaged meal deal so there's a, there's a way where you can have like your semester's meals in our, our um i think it's the fish and chip cafe um you don't have to eat fish and chips every day um that cafe has a like a pre-packaged meal deal i don't know if anybody used that did any of you do that no okay um so it's difficult for them to recommend the person who's asked that question to do so. But I would say this, um, that prepackaged meal deal is getting more popular since we've offered it because more students feel comfortable with that or maybe more parents feel comfortable that their, their son or daughter has that kind of in their pocket. So there's always going to be a way to get food. Um, I did that myself when I studied part of my time at university and it works if you make sure you go there and you get that meal. But if you're a bit lazy and don't get up or you're a bit busy and don't come back, then you've already paid for something that you then are not eating. And then you're going to have to go and get something else later. So you end up kind of paying twice. Um, the most efficient way cost wise is to cook. And that's what five panelists have told you um, or four panelists have told you, including me now. Um, so I think it's good if you if you don't cook. And maybe unlike Shafiq, you're not willing to go for it and, and, and teach yourself no matter what. <laughs> um, but I, I do, I did like it for my first year. I honestly thought it was good for my first year. And then afterwards I valued my independence. So maybe depends on you, um, but the food's good. Um, here's an important question. Where do you go or what do you do when you are sick? Um, I'm, I'm not sure about other people, but for Indonesian student, you will need to pay an insurance fee, I think. Uh, I think before you apply your visa or something. So you need to claim it when you get here. So you need to apply it to the GP and then you can go to the GP when you're sick. But if it's like really emergency, then you can go to the hospital right away. Anyone else? I think it's exactly the same for me as well. <laughs> yeah, so when you apply for your student visa, there is a health surcharge, which is added to the uh, visa charge that you pay. And that enables you, that entitles you to access the National Health Service, the NHS. And that could be if you need to go and see a GP, which is a general practitioner, which is a doctor, um, and you can make an appointment. We have a health centre on campus that you register with, and then you can go and have appointments at the practice, the surgery, wherever you need to go for that. Um, and then also, as Vanya rightly said, if there was something more emergent, if you fell off your rollerblades and broke your knee then you'd have to not go to the gp you'd have to go to the hospital so you would uh, go to the the Dereford hospital which is actually one of the largest hospitals in europe um and it has an emergency department and you don't pay anything for these things you've already paid that health surcharge at the very beginning when you applied for the visa so it's not like you arrive at the hospital and suddenly have to find some money or a credit card no you just arrive and they treat you and that's it so it's an important question. And of course, there are pharmacies nearby the campus as well. There's a big one called Boots in the shopping mall. And the shopping mall is about a five minute walk from the main campus. But there are lots of smaller pharmacies at different parts of the city. In addition to that, the big supermarkets tend to have a pharmacy or related department in them. And it related to that, you can Google very easily nighttime pharmacies because in the city the different pharmacies take turns on different dates to run a nighttime service in case you needed medicine more urgently so you could find out which pharmacy was was still open very very late at night if you needed that um so yes that's an important question and thank you for asking that um okay this is an interesting challenge um a, a student has asked you to please list 
three important items that one should bring to Plymouth? Ooh. I know, challenging. Oh, you can generally get everything you want here, <laughs> but um, yeah, because even like our plots and everything are the same as Singapore, so you don't really mm. have to bring anything specific. Um, also, don't bring too many things, because if you bring a lot of things and then you shop and, and buy stuff here, then you're going to have to bring back a whole lot of things back. So I, I don't know. I think I'm really bad at this. I don't think I can miss like three items, but <laughs> I would say bring like chili. But you can kind of also find it in Asia Mart. Um, and I, I guess whatever, like spices, like if you like like spicy things and they don't really have it here or it's expensive. Yeah, but like chili spices. Yeah, everything else you can get here. <laughs> yeah, for the Indonesian student, you guys need to bring like an adapter because uh, we have a different plug. And then I think I would suggest to bring like spices, sambal, anything like that, because it will help you a lot in here. Um and I think this is just a recommendation, but just just buy your coat here. Do not bring it from the, your country. Good yeah. one. Um, I would suggest like for example, like a uh, raincoat wise for Singaporeans, you can just get it from Decathlon or something like that. Uh, it's really useful. Get your raincoat before you come here because I remember my first day. I came here, everything was fine once the bus dropped me at Plymouth it was raining hell <laughs> and <laughs> I was drenched I was taking cover at the, the, the bus stop hoping to for the rain to stop but it never stopped so ah, anyways um, another thing is spices yeah bring your spices like um, also Maggie chili sauce please bring and uh, yeah I think that's about it everything you can get it here oh one more thing get if you can bring your own boots, I would say, like, I mean, if you if you are wearing your boots to come here, it will be really good. I mean, you can buy it here too. It's pretty affordable because if you want to go for hiking or places like that, you generally need your boots. And especially with the weather here, it's good to have waterproof boots. Yeah, but at the same time, I think it's uh, like, besides Decathlon in Singapore, like everything else is cheaper here. So if you want to buy like mountain mm. warehouse or you want to buy like North Face or whatever, it's all cheaper here. So like if you buy it back home and then you bring it here, it's, it's a bit like double work. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting point you, you guys are making there. And there's a bit of a seesaw about what to bring and what to buy here, what to bring and what to buy here. And I think it might depend on what we're talking about. It also might depend on which country you're in and how expensive things are, what the exchange rates may be. Um, certainly, I think the idea of... If there's something you absolutely know you're going to need, like the chili sauce, you know you're going to use it, then then bring a little bit, but don't bring like a ton of it, um, because there are certain things you can buy here. Um, I do really agree with the idea of pack quite light. We're going to do a pre-departure event, by the way, attendees. We'll do a pre-departure webinar in the summer. Um, and we always say then pack light because you'll buy more stuff when you get here. And, and the temptation is to pack kind of everything definitely power adapters like a plug adapter if you need it for sure um i would say don't bring things like hair dryers or hair curlers or things like that because they sometimes work on different voltages um it's not too bad for major but it's certain parts of the world it can be really they just might not work when they get here so things like that don't waste your space or your luggage allowance on things that you can get here that coat question is difficult. On the one hand, you definitely want to be warm when you get here. On the other hand, because the weather in the UK is colder, there's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of shops that sell them. So the prices are cheaper. I personally am a big fan of the charity shops, in all honesty, because I can get really cool stuff for great prices. And then not everybody else has it because it's older. So it's like not everyone has the same thing. Anywho, um, make sure that as long as you've got layers, you're covered. Um, but yeah, that, that question of to bring it in advance or buy it here is, is tricky. You can do some online price comparisons if you're, if you're not sure. But I'd say if in doubt, leave it out. Don't pack too much stuff because like Clarissa said, you're going to buy more and then you've got to get it home again. Okay, um, a, a question from a student about tuition fees. Do you pay in one go or do you pay it in, in parts? What, you don't have to give us details, guys, but do you prefer to pay your tuition fees in one go or in parts? Um, I, I paid 
yeah, in parts. But I think you can pay in one shot if you want to. Yes, you can. You can pay in one yeah, go. Pay, um, yeah. yeah. Mm, that goes the same for me. I pay in parts. Yeah, usually students will pay in parts because it's just a bit easier for cash flow to do that. Um, and the university doesn't mind that you pay in, in like a, usually in two or three um, installments is quite typical. Um, but some students will be aware there may be a large bank charge made by the bank to do it. So they might prefer to send it in one go. That's OK, too. But it's quite typical to do it in two or three installments. Um, well, if you have Revolut, use Revolut. Oh, right. <laughs> Yeah, if you have Revolut, like I think a lot of us pay our, uh, I mean, my friends and I all pay our school fees using Revolut because the exchange rate is much better than if you pay by bank transfer or by credit card. Yeah. And it's always really important for students in the country that you're in to look into that, what the different options are. Yeah. Like you're in your country and, and what the, the costs or exchange rates might be because it might vary in different countries. So thank you indeed. Um, this is an interesting question. Are there motorcycle rental shops in Plymouth? I honestly don't know. Um, I'd have to look into that. So whoever asked that question could email that question to me and I'll have to look into it offline. Unless you guys know, panel, about motorcycle rental shops? Um, there is one uh, near Motley, just before Aldi. But uh, <laughs> I wouldn't... I mean, there'll be a big uh, culture shock for those motorcyclists who wants to come here. I myself ride motorcycles, so when I came here, I thought, oh, okay, I'm going to ride some motorcycle and ride it out and stuff like that. But now the weather is the weather is not really favorable for motorcyclists here, unless it's coming to spring or summer, but it's really beautiful to, you can rent a motorcycle and, and uh, ride, but also look into the local laws because it's a, a bit different uh, with, for example, for me, I'm from Singapore. Uh, it's a bit different if you want to ride a motorcycle here. Firstly, get your international driving license. Uh, even if you want to ride a motorcycle or drive a car, you can apply it online uh, or you can go to the automobile association from your country. You can get it. And also, for example, motorcycles here, you need to have a full suit and you cannot just ride like what you're riding in, in Singapore or Malaysia. Like you can just ride in shirt and pants. So they have different laws here. So check it out on that. But uh, it's much more common to see people driving a car here than actually riding a motorcycle because of the weather. Correct. Thank you, Shafiq. That's really excellent advice. And that's something I really couldn't provide. But certainly that very most important thing is if you don't have the right licenses, it just can't happen. So look into the international driver's license, whether you intend to drive or ride a motorbike. Um, that's really important. Thank you for that. Um, quick question regarding the airport transfer. Which airport do we pick up from? It's Heathrow. It's always Heathrow. The link that I've put in the chat mentions the Welcome Week, one of the links, one of the many links. And it's got the Welcome Week and it's got the dates of the airport pickup from Heathrow this year. We use Heathrow because it is really the main way that students are coming in to, um, from uh, various countries. That will mean that there's the most flights going into Heathrow and that usually means the cost is lower. So sometimes you might find a flight going into Bristol even via Europe and I've done that sometimes, but sometimes that pushes the price up so much or the, the connection time is so long that it's just easier to go to Heathrow. So that's what I always do and that's why we have the, the airport pickups from Heathrow because that's where most students will arrive. But of course we can give advice and, and information on other airports and how to get to Plymouth, because you know we can help you with that too. You can always email me. Um, okay, so we have healthcare surcharge. Does it include all prescriptions, meaning in future visit the clinic, we don't have to pay additional fees? Has anyone used um, any, um, in the NHS situation, has anyone had a prescription and how was your experience of that? Not used? Mm, I've, I've uh, I'm, I have not used it, but I know that I have friends that used it, so they don't pay anything. But uh, just for, I think this NHS uh, package did not include like for eye check or something, if I'm not mistaken. So when you pay your health surcharge, you there is um, an understanding that you'll be able to get health care and that includes a prescription. So let's say you visit the doctor and they say you have a chest infection and you need some antibiotics or something like that then they will write a prescription for your antibiotics. You will take that to the pharmacy 
and the pharmacist will ask you do you pay for your prescriptions and as a student you will say no I don't and they might ask to show you to show your student card to prove that you're a student and that means that you then don't pay for your prescription I of course am not a student so I do pay for my prescription but that's fine it's the way it works so um then you wouldn't have to pay for your uh, prescription if you go to a dentist again you won't have to pay um, there might be a, a small charge on some things such as the um, dental hygienist, um, but typically if you need um, uh, health care, you will be able to get that and you, you don't have to, to pay for the, the follow ups either. It's all part of the, the National Health Service. Um, during the summer, is the weather very dry? Do we need a very moisturizing face cream? No. I think you, I you won't get a lot of face cream in the winter, actually. <laughs> you won't get really yeah. dry. Yeah, I think coming from a very humid like country, like it, it's very very dry here. Um, yeah, so we put like a lot of layers on our face, but yeah, I mean it's nothing that you can't get here as well. Like, yeah, you can get it as you come along. I find that sometimes myself and other people get kind of like an exposure kind of need on her face. So even on a windy day when it's slightly sunny, but not really hot, um, you can, if you've been outside a lot, like if I've gone to the beach or if I've gone skating or cycling, I find that my face will feel quite red and a little bit exposed because it's kind of wind and light and maybe even the salty water as well. So sometimes, yeah, you might find like an after sun product or, a, or something like that is useful too, but there's nothing that you can't get here. So I wouldn't worry too much about that in advance. Yeah, we've got lots of rice here. Rice is available in the major supermarkets as well as the Asian supermarkets. So you can get big, massive sack of the thing as, as I usually do. And it lasts for many, many, many weeks. Or you can buy small individual bags in the supermarket. Um, do you all buy phone data plan or use Wi-Fi from campus? What do you do about your, your all important web connection for your phone? Um, I think it depends like for like most of us um, as in because I'm only here for like a year so I didn't buy a phone plan but when I think you go to the visa office and when you get the visa they give you like this free sim card from Labrara or something and then it's you just need to top it up um, I think in general my phone is like it's like the sim only so it's I think 10 pounds a month or something yeah and it's more than enough yeah, um, as for me, similar to uh, Clarissa, I also have the Libara SIM card. And to be honest, you don't really need internet here because, come on, I mean, you're walking from your home to your school, which is like less than five, 10 minutes. So I got myself, I think every month I pay about five pounds or something like that. And the good thing about Libara SIM cards is that you can use free roaming, not only in, in, in here, but also... Uh, anywhere in Europe, uh, any of the EU participating countries, and some of the Southeast Asia countries also. So whenever I'm traveling, I don't need to actually change my SIM card or buy a new one or, or get a special plan. It's free roaming. It's, it's, it's per normal, like, like how you buy a normal data. So yeah, you don't really need so much of the data because everywhere you will have mm -hmm. Wi-Fi. Thank you. But maybe you will need like a data when you're traveling. That's an, I think a different topic. But when you're traveling, you will need more data, I think. Okay. Well, it's good to know. And obviously at, at airports and other places, there's also um, Wi-Fi you can hook up to. So it's quite good. And the campus is all Wi-Fi as well. Um, I'm very conscious of time. These questions are amazing. And you brilliant students are fantastic for being on this panel. But we are really stretching my, my time a limit when I, I don't want to stretch your patience. So um, I'm going to see if I can wrap it up a little bit quicker. The question of what cards does the ATM over here accept? Well, if you have a Visa or a MasterCard, it works in everything because all the all the cash machines here work for everything. Um, just check that sometimes the little cash machines, the little ATM that work that may be in a supermarket, in one of those all night supermarkets, sometimes they will charge to take money out. They'll charge a fee. Whereas if you um, have a UK bank account, which you will open when you get here, if you choose to, then you'll have a UK bank card and you put your money from home into that. And then you, when you take money out from any cash machine here, then you won't be charging. That's how I would do it. Do you agree or disagree, guys? 
Um, I have a bank account here in the UK, so I can use the bank account here and transfer the money from home. I think it's quite easy also. Cool. Anyone say differently? I use, I use Revolut. Sounds yeah. revolutionary. Uh, <laughs> next question, are the uni halls quiet at night? Is anyone in uni halls? Yes, I am. And depends, but weekdays it can get loud as well. So if you're a light sleeper, maybe invest in some earmuffs. No, not earmuffs, but like earbuds. Fair enough. I mean, it's, it's, it's student life is a bit like that, but um, yeah, it's part of the experience from my experience anyway. <laughs> um, graduation ceremony is in September. Uh, my accommodation ends what can i do for the interim so if i'm gonna stay until september but my accommodation ends in july what would i do or what would you guys do i think when you book your accounts there's like an option right like you can book either the 40 weeks or you can book 52 weeks um if you're planning to stay you can book the 52 week option if you're not i know a lot of my friends are going back and then coming back for graduation yeah. Or maybe if you have booked it uh, until July, you can just ask to extend it until September, even though you only need to pay a little bit more, but you can extend it. Yeah. And the other option is you could consider going somewhere else for three months if for some reason you didn't want to or couldn't stay there. Some students might just go and stay um, in a temporary accommodation, such as a student um, apartment room. Um, quite often the landlords of those are quite happy to take someone over the summer because otherwise it would be empty so they'd be willing to offer something like that but that's something you can figure out when you're here um, um, but you can ask your current accommodation provider as uh, Vanya said whether there's an extension extension option for you or as Clarissa said if there's a, a different contract duration option for you and you can consider that but I wouldn't I wouldn't put too much stress upon yourself about that because there will be a way that you can do it or indeed, some students might say, hey, I'll just go back and come back again. I mean, it sounds silly, but that, that also works if you wanted to get back to Job Hunt and just come back in September for the event. So I wouldn't worry too much about it right now. There will be options open for you. Um, the last question is the last question on here, and I'm not going to take any more now because we're nearly out of time. It will be <laughs> over time already. Um, about how much money one should have in one's bank account. I think that can really depend on a student. And I, and I don't want to ask and pry into your personal bank account details. Um, we do cover a little bit about um, how you should prepare funds for you when you come over to the UK. And plus, of course, you must remember that when you're applying for your student visa, the United Kingdom visa people, the UKVI, expect you to have a certain amount of, you, of money available to you to support your living costs in order to grant you the student visa. Because we're not London, it's a little bit over £1,000 per month based on a nine months academic year. So if you, if you, that would be covering your accommodation and your food and your transportation and kind of everything that's not tuition fee. So the way to look at it, I would do is if you know that you need to apply for have about £1,000 per month in your bank, generally, including accommodation costs, then you can minus the cost of your accommodation from that. And the remainder would be approximately a few hundred um, per uh, month for your living costs. There's another really good thing that you can do is you can go to UCAS.com and they've got a, a money calculator, a budget calculator. And you can look at, at what the cost of living is per different part of the, the country, including Plymouth. And it comes up to a, a bit lower than the £9,000 that the UKVI say. I don't wish you to prepare less money, but I want you to be aware that it, depending on your lifestyle, you don't have to spend as much as the UKVI are telling you to. Is there something you'd like to add, guys? Tricky one, I know, because it really depends on your lifestyle. Okay, so um, any more questions about preparing money either for traveling to the UK or arrival within the UK, please note we're going to do a pre-departure webinar in the summertime, probably around July time, and we'll get into a little bit more nuts and bolts about that then. Okay, listen, I'm going to stop the questions now because they've been super duper questions. So thank you, dear attendees, for your excellent questions. But much more importantly, thank you to the panel as well, because I can't answer these questions from my wonderful attendees because I'm not a student and your perspective is invaluable. So thank you one and all. Thank you, Clarissa. Thank you, Milia, Shafiq and Vanya. Thank you. Excellent efforts.
Anything else you want to say or are we all done? You're free to go and spend the rest of your day doing something more fun. All good? We're all good. Well, well done again. I'll be in touch with you by email soon. Um, and thank you, attendees. And we'll speak to you again in the summer for the pre-departure webinar. Have a great day. I'm going to end the webinar now. Bye.